Okay, so last time we talked about monads and we learned a little bit about monads. There is more to it. Um, and today I want to talk about the most, the weirdest monad that we all know and love, that the I.O. monad. Okay, there is a lot of misunderstanding about it. I.O. monad. So I.O. monad, as the name suggests, uh, uh, deals with input and output. And now conceptually thinking about it, it's like, how can a pure language deal with I.O. Right? A pure function. A pure function cannot do something like get char, right? Because get char is supposed to return different characters depending on what happens uh, in the external world. The user does, right? Uh, and the same thing is with uh, printing to the screen, right? Uh, put stir, what does it do? Well, it returns like uh, nothing, right? Uh, so, how can the, the runtime actually execute it if its return value is never used, right? Because it's just a unit. This unit d disappears. There's no way to like force the, the printing of something if, if we were doing it naively. So this is why we encapsulate this into a monad for sequencing and uh, for these side effects. But I told you before, you know, there's no, no side effects. Monads are not about side effects, right? So, um, was I lying? Um, no. And, uh, and I can uh, uh, wave my hands a lot and convince you that <laughs> this is not side effects, okay? Um, so there, there are like two ways of explaining it and they are interleaved a little bit. One way is from the point of semantics and this is like the original paper by Moji. Um, this is how he treated this. He was only interested in uh, the notational semantics. So like how to translate this stuff into math essentially, right? How to explain what's happening using math. And math does not have the notion of time, for instance, right? So it, it doesn't know, you know, one thing should go before another and that it takes time that you, like if you want a character that you might block, what does it mean to block waiting for something, right? That's not a mathematical notion of blocking. Um, <clears throat> so from the point of view of just uh, semantics, the program sees some stuff coming in and, and it also outputs some stuff and it doesn't know anything about the external world. So it could, it could as well think, if program were thinking, okay, I'm, I'm anthropomorphizing a little bit. So the program thinks, okay, here's this place somewhere that contains data, okay? And I can get at this data by calling get jar, right? And this data will, will kind of appear, right? And it doesn't know that there's a human on the other side typing or moving the mouse. That doesn't matter. It's just like a source of data. So it can be um, thought of as um, just a buffer with input, okay? But this is not how we think about it, right? We think, okay, at some point the program will ask me what's your name and I'm going to type my name and only then the name will be available to the program. But from the point of the view of the, of the program, you know, who has a completely different philosophy of life, it looks like this stuff was there from the very beginning, from the beginning of the universe, right? So there's some kind of predestination, philosophically speaking, that all user actions are predestined. So there is a buffer with user actions 
that I was given at the beginning of the program, right? And I'm just picking stuff from this buffer. All the mouse moves, all the keys, keystrokes and so on, they are already in this buffer, right? And, and uh, this sort of sounds weird because, uh, I mean, a lot of programmers think that, you know, we are supposed to expect some kind of input, like if I ask you for your phone number, then I'm expecting digits, right? But that's that's not true, you know. This is this is a source of a lot of bugs that we expect a certain input. We actually should assume that any input is possible, right? And and some of the testing does this, the, the you know black box testing, uh, fuzz box te testing, you know, some monkeys typing and moving the mouse in random ways. I'm asking you for a phone number and you are typing your name or typing, you know, the text of Hamlet, complete works of Shakespeare, or whatever, right? You have to be prepared for this. So all that the program is doing is, is just uh, uh, saying, give me the next thing from the buffer, whatever it is, right? And I can deal with everything. I will apply some calculation to it, I will apply some function to it, and so on. So there are, there are essentially two things that we can, we can do uh, in order of difficulty or complexity. One thing is um, just get this input and apply a function to it, right? So if we encapsulate all this input into a monadic value, which is the IO monad, right? Then, uh, then we can just, if we want to apply function to the input, we'll just use fmon. Right? Because it's a functor, and all, every monad is a functor too. So just applying function to input is no problem, right? It's, it's just f. Um, but sometimes we have this, uh, uh, like we are parsing something, or, you know, uh, there, there might be a fork. Like depending on whether the user says yes or no, we execute different code, right? And this is also poss possible in the monad. The bind actually allows us to do this. Now, you, you, you've seen a, an example of in do notation where we are saying, you know, get me a, uh, get me uh, safe square, right? And if this safe square returns zero, then output an error. Otherwise, um, output, you know, the reciprocal of the square, right? But this is done through bind, right? So with bind, we can actually fork stuff. Even though we don't have access to the value that's sitting there because it's enca encapsulated in, in the I.O. monad, we can still do forking based on, on what we got from the user. Um, so so this, is, this is very important, that you can, uh, in monadic code, you can actually decide what to do based on what was given to you in the monadic form. Because a monad normally does not, uh, at least in the definition of the monad, there is no get value. Right? We cannot reach to the monad and say, give me this character that was given to you by the user. Okay? Now I want this character. No, you can't do this. All you can do is apply a function to this hidden character. Or string. Right? You apply a function. And in particular, using bind, you can apply a function that forks based on, on the content. Yeah. What I'm trying to uh, contrast it with is applicative because in in applicative okay we haven't talked about applicative but there is a big distinction between monad and applicative in applicative you cannot actually fork based on on the contents like so so with with fmap you cannot say okay I'm gonna skip this thing because uh, the value is this and this and fmap doesn't let you skip stuff right and Mona lets you
bypass stuff. So from the point of view of the program, we are talking about uh, semantics of the program. From the point of view of the program, there is no screen, there is no teletype. What the program sees is that it can write to something, right? And this something can as well be a buffer. There is no difference between just passing the program a buffer into which this program writes stuff, right? And uh, threads this buffer through all these functions that do output. And the situation in which some output appears on the screen. The program doesn't know anything about that. So the, the state monad is something that really um, describes this process in Haskell best. So we can think of, of, of a program, the, the, the program that uses IO monad as producing these uh, IO actions, which are just functions that take state or the buffer in this case, and produce value and modified state, right? And we can even use do notation so that we don't see the passing of the state at all. It's invisible, you know, and we don't have to worry about it. But the state is just invisible and it's being passed from one function and function. And, and uh, the fact that these things are sequenced is because the output of one function becomes input to another function. And this output, by the output I mean the state, right? Because state monad has a function that produces a pair state value. And this state has to be passed to the next function. So the, the bind in this case, right? passes the state between functions. So imagine that, that you have, you were given a, a buffer, and every function writes to this buffer, passes this buffer to the next one, the next one appends to it again, it passes it to the next one, the other one writes into this buffer again, you know, and, and eventually, you know, they are done. Now, with state, uh, state mola, the constructor for state mola contains um, a function, right? State mola is, is really this function um, that takes state right, and produces a pair of value and state, right? Yeah, in this order, okay. So, if you chain these things, right, these, these Kleisley arrows, uh, then eventually what you get at the end is, again, a function that's like a combination of all these functions with passing of the state and so on. But at the end, if you actually want to use this um, state monad, right? You have to run it. You have to run this function. You have to provide some initial state, right? Run this function and you'll get back some value and the modified state. So this is the big secret of the IO monad that there is no way of executing this, this, this function that does IO. Like with, uh, with um, state monad, we had something like, uh, I don't know if I mentioned it, but there is a function run state that takes uh, a state, the initial state, and it takes the you know, state of, so I'm saying run state s some a, s a, right? And it produces a pair a, uh, a, s. 
So run state is this function that actually gets stuff out of the monad. The only way of getting out of this state monad is to, to call run state, which just, and, and give it an initial state, and state SA is actually a function, and this function can be run on the state and will produce this. Right? Is that clear? In order to get out of this monad, because everything is encapsulated in this monad is encapsulated into some function or combination of functions, one function after another, and so on. But at the end, we want the value. And in order to get this calculate, the, you know, run this calculation to get the value, we have to provide this initial state and run. And this is where this kind of what, what we think is non-deterministic actually is deterministic because if, if we provide a different state, we'll get a different result, right? So the variation in this, like normally, you know, we started with an impure function to introduce state, an impure function that has access to some state. Then we turned it into a pure function that takes state as an argument. All right, so, but, so this this all all makes sense with respect to the, the state monad. I I, I, right. get, I get that. Where, where okay, so let let me talk now about the IO monad. Okay, great. Yeah, that's that's what I. I just introduced this this okay. notion that you know you can do your monadic calculations using bind and return and so on, but at the end when you are done and everything, then you have to run it, right, provide so, the state. Yeah and get some result. That's not true with the I.O. mode. Well, it's half true, okay? Because what happens is that the I.O. monad does not have run I.O. monad, run I.O. You don't have access to run I.O., okay? That function is not part of the type class, so... It's not part of the type class, it's never defined in any library, it's never defined by the runtime. There is no such function. There is no way to run I.O. inside the Haskell program. Mm -hmm. But there is a character. Yeah, but it returns a state thingy, or I.O. monad, monadic object. And it returns the same one every time because it's a pure function. Right, right. It returns the same monadic state. But, but this monadic thing, we know that it contains really a function and we have to provide something to this function. So if we are talking only about output, let's say, let's concentrate on output, right? Um, so you can, you can think of it as, you know, state where, where the state is a buffer, a list. Take a list. And, and all these functions actually uh, are functions that append stuff to the buffer, you know. And at the end, you could give it a buffer and run this this function, the, the resulting function, and you'll get back a new buffer and uh, uh, and some result. Well, okay. So that's not what's happening in I/O. In I/O. The only thing you can do with, with the final I.O. object that you produce, the final I.O. value that you produce, is you can return it from main. That's it. And, and in a Haskell program, main has this signature, right? Main is I.O. And usually it's I.O. of unit, right? That's not necessarily, you know, you can have any type there, but we wouldn't know what to do with this. You know, maybe passing some error return to the operating system, but that's dependent, depending on operating system, right? Like, I think in Windows or in Linux, too, right? You can, you can pass a return value from a program that you are running. But in most cases, this is just you. 
you're not passing anything out. <coughs> so this IO. So all your calculations that you did, they are <coughs> chained together inside this one IO value. That is your main. So after you get this I.O. value, when you calculate, you know, you run your program, you get at the end this I.O. value. And this I.O. value you can think of as a state moment. And at the end, you know, when, when you pass this I.O. thing to the runtime, this is where the work starts. Okay? So what you are passing to the system, to the runtime, is instructions how to what kind of input and output you want it to do this way you can have your whole program completely pure and this ugly dirty impure stuff happens after your program is executed at least conceptual okay so you see this this way we preserve the purity of the program we don't do any I.O., real I.O., inside the program. We just combine the instructions to do I.O., right? Like, like an expression, an expression tree. tree. Yeah, exactly, right? So we are building this expression tree and passing it out, and then there is a, an external interpreter which is dirty, and it does all the input and output. I thought you promised us that there was not going to be any Zen here. <laughs> well, there, there, is, there is this no, denotational semantics in which you have to like, think like a program. Okay? You have to like, close your eyes and meditate, you know, and say, I am a program. What's happening to me, right? <laughs> so that's the Zen here. Now, uh, so that's that's uh, that's the explanation from the point of view of, of view of semantics, and it leads us to this this idea of a, a sort of pseudo state monad, right? And this is where the second um, explanation starts, which is more operational. It says, you know, what's what's happening uh, when I'm executing this stuff. And, um, and it's based, again, on this idea that I.O. is really a state moment. But what is the state that we are passing it? Okay? What is the state that's being threaded through all these actions? Right? Well, this, it's the state of the world. Right? That's, this, that's, that's the world in which there is a programmer who's or user who's typing stuff, moving the mouse, and so on. I mean, that sounds crazy, really, right? But from the point of view of mathematics, the, the fact that state is this whole world, you know, with humans in it, um, is okay. <laughs> no. It, it is crazy, but, you know, I no, just expand, okay, expand your consciousness. <laughs> And this, this sort of like, and this is a very philosophical thing, right? Because it sort of assumes, suggests that the world is predestined, right? That everything that the user does can be sort of taken into account in your program. That there is no non-determinism. So, so people think about this different ways, you know, sometimes using um, denotational semantics, sometimes using this idea that it's really a state mona. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> the, the implementation of this stuff actually is a state mona. And uh, there is an object called world. Real world. Real world, yes? Yeah, it's called real world. <laughs> and it's being passed. So, you know. It's just organized through, through functions that take real form. Yes? So is this the time to ask the get care question? Get care returns an IO care. 
Yes. And we can't look inside it, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Technically speaking, get char is a value, not a function. Uh, well, so you can make get char prime that takes a unit and returns. Uh -huh. No, let's just let's just uh, you know think about functions that as being very general. So there are nullary functions, which are just values. Okay. okay? So this okay. this so is a value, case, but it's a nullary. We have a pure function mm -hmm. which returns this thing called an IO care. Yeah. What I can't get my mind around yes. is the IO care walks like a duck that gets has a different value inside of it each time it's called. And IO objects are allowed to do that? Or IO <coughs> No, there's a pure function called get care or get but, 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 or but this is this is kind of uh, a philosophical statement, you know, that that uh, get char returns a different character every time. So you can never look, look at this character, so how do you know it's different? So, I agree, kind of, but it had results in different behaviors of my screen. So if I take uh -huh. good care and then put care, uh -huh. if my screen sits there and waits, and then it echoes Mm -hmm. One at a time. And I don't, I mean, maybe there's some syllogistic <laughs> mumbo jumbo, uh -huh. but it looks like a duck. Uh -huh. It looks like it's getting the okay. character that I okay. passed into it. So imagine this your, your program, when, when you call, when, when you are calling get char. What does it return? Right. Or what is it? If an IO pair. Right. It's a function. Of a unit. So it should return a no, unique no. value. It's Only a, one right, value right. ever, ever, ever. Uh, yeah, and this value that it returns, and it's always the same value, it's a function. Okay? It's always the same function. This function accepts as input the world and returns the modified world plus, the, plus the, the value of the character, right? So now if you call it with different worlds, you will get different characters as a noun. Just like here, right? You call it with different state, you'll get a different A. You'll get a different S and you'll also, also get a different A, right? Both of them. So this is your state of your keyboard and your screen, you know, and you get back a new screen in which this stuff is typed in. The, the output is, is there. Now, if you think about it, um, since Haskell is a lazy language, right? It actually uh, does not return like everything evaluated. What it returns, the main, what main returns is is, a, is just uh, a, a bunch of thumbs, right? Okay. So when the runtime gets this stuff, this this uh, um, expression to be evaluated, it interleaves doing input output with evaluating these pure functions that were in the program. They are in t uh, encapsulated in these thumbs. And this is, this is when the actual execution of all these pure parts of the program takes place. Right? So all these pure things are, they are really thumbs. And they are executed when you are executing, when the runtime is executing whatever was returned from main. And what's returned from main is this set of commands to get input, produce output, interleaved with these pure thumbs. This is not really what happens there, 
No, but okay. philosophically, but philosophically, that's what happens. Philosophically, you're telling me that I should think of an I don't care as some machine that is out in the world. Any characters. So that's not what we should do. Yes, get Star Wars into a machine to get your characters. Get your characters. Yeah. It doesn't even get me a character. It just. Yeah, it goes and gets your characters and does it. Goes and gets the program after Main has finished building the full uh, I/O value. That mach the machine is run after that point. Right. But yes. Yeah, so and and when you are say you you know get me a character and then if this character is a digit. Uh, do something, and if it's not a digit, just do something yeah, else, right? Yeah, part is pure. That, yeah. I don't have yeah. any trouble with it. Okay. You, you are so just adding additional here. functions on top of the function that get char returned. Say, okay, apply get char, right, and then bind it to this function that forks, you know, and so on. So when I say that get time is an impure function, Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to think of the Haskell get time mm -hmm. as returning you a clock. No, it returns an instruction how to get time. Or, <coughs> yeah. And when it's executed, eventually, outside of main, you know, it will actually read the, the clock. It gets you a machine mm -hmm. that can read yeah. the clock. Read, read the clock and I think of this as Haskell program is actually producing a program for the runtime. And the runtime, of course, is impure. But the program itself is pure. By in generating this new program, it does only pure things. But its output is a new program that is being executed afterwards by the runtime. It gets me a clock or a display machine or It doesn't give you a clock really, it gives you an instruction how to read the clock. And then at the end when you provide the world to it, it will take this world and read the clock from there. And it will give you the time that's actually in this world is the current time. Okay. okay. So in, in practice, uh, so, so this is philosophical, just, just to convince you uh, that you can always think of a Haskell program as a pure expression, right? Or a pure function that takes no arguments, or just pure expression that produces a, a result that's in the I.O. moment. Okay? And then the other thing is that you can never get at the uh, contents of this I.O. moment. It's always hidden from you. The only thing you can do is apply more and more functions to it. And okay, they right. Yeah? Okay, so I, I'm, I'm going to pr propose a, um, uh, a, a scenario that I, I, don't, I don't understand how this works with, with I.O. in Haskell. Okay, so suppose we have uh, just a sequence, right? A lazily computed sequence we ask it for some digits, and it says here one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I have some, I have some thing, I have some value that represents this lazily computed sequence. Okay. Now suppose I have a function which takes two sequences, right, and let's say sums them, right. Okay. I can pass that lazily computed sequence one through ten to that function twice, right, mm -hmm. and then I would get two, four, six, eight. 10, 12, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so suppose I have, suppose I, I consider the IO monad to be a lazily computed sequence of values, right? If I pass it to that function that sums two things, right, that sums two sequences, right? If I pass the, these lazily computed sequences of IO values twice, what happens? Is it okay? So you are sequencing two I/O actions. Yes. Right. Okay. Well, so if you are sequencing the two I/O actions, they are sequenced using the bind operator, mm -hmm. right? And inside the bind operator, 
it gets the value from the first calculation right. plus the world and passes this value and the world to the next calculation or discards the value. Right. But passes a world that's different than was passed in the first place, right? So this new world that was modified during the computation already can produce different values for you. Alright, I'm still not sure that I followed, but I'm gonna actually try to write some code. Uh -huh. And see if I can figure out where it goes wrong. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if code really helps here because <laughs> Because you don't see what's happening behind. Because I mean, I'm telling you, it's a state moment, right? But but that's that's just my word against your word. <laughs> uh, All right. The well, compiler implements it this way, I'll see but that only for the purposes of sequencing. Yeah. But if you think that there is state, you know, I mean, if you have two stateful computations, right, and you hide the state. You don't see it. You know, you run it twice, you will get a different answer the second time because your state has changed, right? Yeah, no, I see that. Yeah, okay. So here the state is, the state is humongous, right? It's the universe. <laughs> but conceptually, the same thing. Okay, so let me write some um, code to um, like familiarize ourselves with the I.O. monad, how it's used. We've seen a little bit of it, but it was always uh, just main equals putster, right? And putster produces a monadic value, so main is a monadic value, it's great, right? But, but you don't really see that there is a monad in there because it's just in the uh, definition of the function or in the type signature of the function, you can see the IO monad, but you don't touch it really. Okay. So a more interesting thing to do would be, like, say, um, main that does a f combines a few actions in it, right? So main equals. And we can combine these actions. The simplest thing and that that's almost always done is to use do notation. Right? Because we are combining monadic values of type IO. So we are in the IO monad. We can use do notation for it. Right? And suppose that we want to say um, print, no, uh, put, put stir line. Okay. Say, what's your name? Okay. So that's one action. Next, we want the input from the user. So how do we do this? We say name gets. What do you call get stir, right? Get stir. Okay. Now get stir returns what? IO of char. That's IO string. Hmm? IO string. Ah uh, string, yeah, okay, sorry. I was thinking of get char. I confused you. <laughs> yeah. So it returns I.O. in which we think there is hidden a string internal, right? But with do notation, we can sort of pretend that we are accessing this string, right? Exactly That's, access. No, we, when we desugar this, you will see that we are not really ac accessing this, this value, right? But if it's inside do, it looks like we got the string. Hey, we got the string. Now we can say, you know, print the string. Oops, term, line, and say, well, let me put a dollar sign. I 
concatenated with name. Right? So this is a very simple program that prints what's your name, gets the name from the user, and then prints high name. We heard that. Yeah, it does. No, put put Sterling. Okay, put Sterling has the signature I/O of unit, right? That's the signature of put stir. So this is I/O of nothing, which is what main is supposed to be. So the last line produces the final output, which is which has the correct signature. Well, get line? Get line more. No, I don't think there's a get string. There is no get string. No. Every language is different. <laughs> I think it's a get string. There, is there a get string or get line? It's get line. Uh, I've seen the get string as well. There is no get string. Get line. Yeah. Oh, okay, get line. Mm -hmm. Fine. Because it actually gets uh, a string until courage return. Right? So yes. it really gets a line. It doesn't stop before it hits the end of the line. Okay. Now, if we want to desugar this, okay. So you you know that in do notation you have, um, you know, you you call this function and it returns you this I/O of unit, right? And this is, as I said, I/O string. I'm putting these type signatures here so that we know what's going on. <coughs> so the, the, sh the, uh, the sugaring would be, okay, let's do this and then bind it using the bind operator to the rest, right? Now in this case, actually there is a shortcut because we are discarding the result of the previous one and we are not using it as an argument to the next one, right? You're kind of using it for a sequence, you know? Yeah. But there is a special version of the bind operator that discards its argument. It's just for convenience, right? I mean, we could have done it with writing a lambda that takes a unit, right? But, but there is, I want you to, to uh, I want to introduce this. This is, uh, I don't know what's the name of this, or Chevron. Right? <laughs> it's a Chevron operator. And, and, the, and, and it's very similar to bind, except that it doesn't... Uh, so, so for every monad we can do this. So let's say monad n takes ma, then takes mb, and returns mb. Right? Normally we would have here a function from A to MB. Right? If, in, if we are writing bind, it would be a function of A and B. But really if A is um, Yeah, if, if, if A is unit then then here uh, yeah. we don't have the argument. So we can, we can just skip. It's pronounced then. Then, okay. The chevron is pronounced then. And in fact, this can be implemented. This, this guy can be implemented. So let's say we have MA, chevron, MB. Okay. This value MA, value MB, without spaces. I'm just calling these variables MA. So it, we can we can express this as M A, which uh, bind to a lambda, but this lambda ignores its argument. So we put a wild card here. Okay, this lambda ignores its argument and just produces M. However, it doesn't mean that you can discard M A. Right? Because this lambda doesn't use the value. Uh, you cannot discard it because inside 
if this is a state monad, in, for instance, right, inside this bind operator, we are passing a state, and this guy <coughs> modifies the state when it's executed, right? It's a function here, function from state, and produces a new state. We have to pass the state to this operator. Okay? So, the desugaring. Let's proceed with uh, desugaring. So, we will do this, and then we will put a chevron here. Oh, maybe I should write it here. We will put a chevron, and then, uh, and then do this, right? And then put a bind of lambda name and this. Okay? Okay, so this is like, you know, we wouldn't have this. Just get line. So get line here produces a monadic value that contains a character and it's bound to this lambda. And name actually appears as an argument to the lambda. So it's not really something that was returned by getLine. Uh, it's, it's something that's an argument to our lambda. It's a name that we assign to it. That's how you desugar this. And of course, I'm ignoring here the correct indentation. The correct indentation would be, you know, like, uh, Steps. That's why you know the, the sugared version is harder to read and, and leads to this indentation. If you if you combine a lot of this these actions, you will you will get like get to the end of your screen. Okay. But that's that's how it the sugar. And the interesting thing is that, <clears throat> that this chevron here, it really like separates statements, right? If you look at it from the point of view of an imperative programmer, you have a statement that outputs this uh, string, and then you have another statement that gets line. And what's in between is this chevron. And this chevron really, in imperative programming, would be se semicolon. Right? So, And this bind here would also be a semicolon, but it would be a more complicated semicolon. It's sort of overloaded semicolon that does some stuff between the calls of the function, right? Whereas normally, you know, in imperative programming, uh, a semicolon just does nothing. It discards the previous result and, and starts a new statement. Right? Because statements don't return any values. They just modify something variable. So, so this is why, you know, when I, when I started this, uh, these classes, you know, I said that uh, imperative programs, what they do is, is they use monad all the time, right? All their code is monadic. And the monad sits in the semicolon. They are sequencing stuff. Okay, we know how to sequence stuff too. We do it this way, okay? And and uh, you know sometimes he, he, the, the, the optimizer in imperative programs has a lot of heavy lifting to do because it has to be.